Okay, I think we're all here. Uh, welcome to the missing piece of the profit economy. Uh, my name is Victor Alice, and uh, I'm CEO of Quintic, but most of all, I'm a guy that likes to solve puzzles. When I was 15 years old, they brought out a Rubik's Cube, and I spent a few weeks working on it until I got it solved. There was no internet, there were no books, and it was probably the best puzzle I solved in my life. And when I get to university, I started writing rostering programs for my old high school to explain how they could do a better job. And then there were programs that played thinking games. And then at some stage, 15 years ago, I founded a company called Quintic, which has, a, has as a goal to solve all the planning puzzles in the world with a single software, uh, with a single software platform. Now, what I want to do today is talk with you about what it means to you what solving puzzles means to you. And what we're going to talk about is, first, what is an economy? Because if you talk about profit economy, you may not have heard the term. Let's first agree on what an economy is. An economy is about wealth and resources. It is about goods and services. It's about consuming and producing. And it's typically mentioned in the context of a region or a country. But if you change region or country to business, then you still have an economy. Your business is about what you own and the resources that you have. It's about what you consume in raw materials and what you produce, whether it's goods or services. And when we talk about economy, nowadays we talk about you know, green economy and we talk about uh, corporate citizenship and we talk about all these things. But, but at the end of the day, the one thing that it all starts with is profit. If you as a business do not make profit, you will be out of business soon, despite all your other good intentions. So you're all here representing businesses and you're trying to optimize the business. And you do that in order to have better profit so that you can keep growing that business and do all the other things that are important. Now, when you look at the business, one of the things that is going to stand out is to be able to shape the business, you need to control your future. And that is going to be a hint towards where that missing piece is. So let's look at a business that we will have this, this picture on a little bit more. In the center you see profit, and then you see all sorts of aspects of your business from R&D and supplies and customers and distribution and production. And probably most of that somehow finds a place in your business. Now, if you look at the cycle of innovation, as Jeffrey Moore describes it, typically the products that you deliver to the markets or the services that you deliver to the markets go through a cycle of innovation. It all starts with an idea. And in that stage, you don't really need supply chain experts because you first need to work out that idea. And that's, that's a phase that I'm not going to concentrate too much on. But once you have that idea and you bring it to the market and you're successful with it, you're quickly scaling up that business. And now you have all sorts of supply chain problems. Where do I put my factories? How do I set up my distribution network? And that distribution network that I have this week is not going to be good enough three months from now because I'm ramping up this business. Do we need to open factories in China? Do I need to go for a global rollout? So this, this exciting phase where you're deploying at scale, you have all sorts of supply chain challenges in creating that supply chain. But then at some stage, no matter what, competition catches up. And it's now no longer the question whether you had the best idea, but also can you manage it as efficiently as possible? And then, you know, no matter what and no matter how great ideas, at some stage there is an end of life and that, then, you know, something new comes in. And, you know, I have an iPhone and, you know, 2007 the iPhone came on the market and it was the coolest thing ever. And Apple's challenge at that point was how do we scale up their production? That was their phase of deploying. And right now, when I look at all my colleagues, everybody either has an iPhone or they have a Galaxy or maybe a Windows phone. They're really in the third quadrant now. It's now managing how do you look at prices and how do you deliver better and do you have it in red instead of in only black and white. And, and at some stage, and I don't know when it is, at some stage you know, the iPhone will no longer be because it has gone through that cycle. So we all go through that cycle. Now it's the top two quadrants. That's why you're here. Because you need to grow your supply chain or you need to manage it to efficiency. And in both cases, which is 80% of the life cycle of these kinds of products, um, there is a challenge if you look at the timeline. So this is 
how you can look at your business. If you look at where you are today, which is we are here, then you can look backwards and look back at what happened yesterday, what happened last week, what happened the first five months of the year. And you will have you know, good moments, maybe depicted as you know, a little bit higher, you had bad moments where you had some issues, but there is this single reality that happened so far. There are no decisions to be made. You can't go back to the 1st of April and say, oh, let's do that differently. Now, if you know what happened, if you want to know what happened, please go and look in your ERP system, because it will have it all. It will tell you exactly what happened, and that's great, because, you know, it helps to know what happened in the past. If you want to have, know what happens right now, you probably have some sort of an execution system that, that is about the approximately right now. It's about the very recent past, what happened in the last few hours, you know, orders that may still be open, but you know, you still finalize it. And it also reaches into the future by a little bit. Some schedules are already on the shop floor, and, and really you can't change them anymore. You know, people are, you know, putting raw materials in front of the machine. Drivers have their papers to go drive somewhere. Employees have their schedules and know what they need to do. And you can't just say, you know, five minutes from now, change everything. In most cases, there's a little bit of commitment to the future. But then when you go further into the future, and it starts a few hours from now, suddenly you have all these choices and more choices and more choices until if you look a little bit ahead, you have like an infinite possible number of futures that you could still shape. Sometimes it's just, who's going to do what tomorrow? Many employees, many drivers, many production machines, many orders, who's going to do what in what sequence and where? And the number of possibilities increases very quickly when the horizon, when the horizon goes further uh, uh, forward, then, um, um, and, um, and you, know, you get this like infinite number of possibilities. Now the problem is, these are not all equal. All these different futures have a different evaluation. In some cases, you've missed that enormously important order for a customer, and now they are, you know, canceling some contracts, they're demanding some demerits or penalties or whatever, and in other cases, you've just done great. The question is, how do you navigate all these possibilities? I'm not sure if there's a red light somewhere. Oh, there it is. Right, so over there. Now, and this is what the missing piece is. Because in most businesses, when we look at how you're managing your future, many people use an Excel sheet for their demand planning or their S&P planning. They have planners who make really smart decisions. At least that's what you hope, because that's what you hire them for. But if you ask them, so how many schedules did you look at? Their answer is typically, well, the one I just made. If you ask, well, there's like an infinite number of possibilities. How did you look at that? They're like, well, I just made a really good schedule. I'm good at my job, so we're doing that. There's no way that you really master that future. And your ERP system is not helping you. They're just telling you what to do, not how to do it. And that's a problem. That's a problem. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at three aspects of your business. One is the distribution side. One is the production side. And the third is related to people that, that do work. And look a little bit in more detail what this really means and how much your gap is in your personal, your business, in your profit economy. So let's look at distribution. And um, just can I see a show of hands? Who is responsible for running trucks in your organization? Somewhere. There are some. There are a few people here, right? Running trucks. Do you have as many as six trucks? More, even more. Okay, so this would be a simple example then. So here we have six trucks. We have 43 delivery locations, and we do that from a central depot. Well, that seems like a relatively simple puzzle, so let's, let's look at that. Now, unfortunately, if you look at that whole network of all possible connections, the total number of ways to do this is about 10 to the, to the power of 50. And to understand that number, yes, that's more than a million. It's even more than a billion. It is about equal to the number of atoms in planet Earth. So if you want to inspect all of these options, it's like inspecting all the individual atoms in planet Earth. That, that's, that's, that's a lot. So the question is, how do we come to a good solution? Now, what you practically typically do is someone starts out and they create a solution. There you go. Six trucks and we deliver everything. And then someone looks at it and says, well, that's kind of strange. You have here, there is, a, is, is that okay? Couldn't you better go like there and then there and then back? That seems shorter. And then the answer is, yeah, but this customer has a, 
important time window, and otherwise we would be there too late. And then you see that the visual is not everything, because there's also time windows. And if you wonder, is this other truck capable to pick something up? Yeah, but the size of the load is already exceeded, you know, is already the maximum of what you can do. So it is quite possible that this is the best solution. And your planner would probably tell you, this is a really good solution. This is how we typically do it. We send one guy to the west, and we send one guy to the east, and then a few there, and this is how we do it. And it's 504 miles. We deliver everybody on time, all good. Then there might be this question, well, you know, this kind of you know, thing that can never be right, but if there's a single entry road in that community, you can go left around or right around, so sometimes you have these circles. Now, in this particular case, there's another solution which only uses four trucks. This solution doesn't necessarily look better up to the naked eye. I can go back, this one or this one. You don't see the difference. But then your bottom line is 8%. 8% difference. Most businesses do not realize that they're losing this kind of money on different routes. And that's only six trucks. So now let's make it a little bit more scalable to what you are probably doing, because you probably don't have six trucks. Let's look at an example where you have 100 trucks. Anyone has 100 trucks? There you go. At least 100 trucks. This is 1,000 deliveries with 100 trucks. The number of possibilities now is 10 to the power of 2,500. Is that the atoms in the universe? No, that's only 10 to the power of 80. There's just no way that we can describe how many options there are. So anyone who says, yeah, we looked at everything and this is the optimal solution, bullshit. Sorry, had to say. Anyway, so it's really difficult to solve this puzzle. Now, here is a solution that to the naked eye looks beautiful. What you have to know is, these are all little clusters, like a little village, where you have eight or ten deliveries that you need to make. They all have different time windows, and there's one truck driving there, doing its deliveries and going back home to the depot. And it's an almost full truck. So if you look at this, this is just a beautiful solution. Hundred trucks, there's almost, or there's a little, little one there that you know, goes like a little bit diagonal. But other than that, it's like a perfect solution. Forty-two and a half thousand miles. Now, this is a solution that doesn't look so good. Yeah, here, you're skipping to the other village, skipping to the other village. We're doing a lot of things there. This is the world record on this puzzle. 3,000 miles better than the previous solution. Ten trucks less. In this particular case, all trucks are completely filled up. Except there's one-third of a truckload still hidden in empty capacity. It's impossible to do it with 89. Ten percent less trucks. 7% fewer miles, and if you take the average you know, balance, the, the estimated benefits to your business would be between $1 and $2 million if you're running 90 or 100 trucks. The best solution, the world record solution published on benchmarking websites created by our company, 3,000 miles better than the solution that looks really cool. So this, to my, to my um, mind, proves the fact that you cannot just trust good-looking solutions or planners making solutions or people inspecting a single solution or going for some heuristics that, you know, you should never have these little, um, you know, shapes where routes are crossing each other. Now, the question is, does this really happen in practice? Well, um, if you look at some of the examples that we see in our practice, one of the things we do for a lot of companies is we do benchmarks. We ask companies, oh, you have 90 trucks or 100 trucks, tell us what your rules are. Give us the addresses of your customers. Give us the routes that you actually run for a week. And then we'll run it through our software. It has never happened that we weren't at least 5% better. Never. And then typically what happens, we give a solution, and they say, yeah, 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 you can't do that. Oh, there's another rule, we'll add the rule, we're still 5% better. Typically, we're between 5% and 20% better. So in your distribution, if there is a little bit of complexity and it starts with six trucks, but it really, you know, if you have 100 trucks, it is really uh, a complex, a thousand deliveries. If you are there, there is enormous amount of hidden potential because we see it time and time again. Now, if you look at a company like DHL, um, they have implemented um, a software uh, in 50 countries or so, and they take this to the next level with us. So one of the things that you can do, and that also planners cannot do manually, 
is be really responsive to changes. So the example of what I think the state of the art of this kind of optimization in, say, express delivery is, is what happens in Berlin. So in Berlin, we implemented the, you know, the pickup and delivery for express business for DHL, but Berlin, you know, is congested like many cities. So you want to make sure that if you're going for that special pickup up there, that you don't get stuck in traffic. So the taxi network in Berlin actually has, everybody has a GPS responder in their, in their taxi. And that information in real time is sent to a database that tells us for every single street where a taxi is in or has been in just recently, what the actual speed in the road network is. And then while doing these kinds of optimizations, you take not the expected road speeds in Berlin, but you take the actual right now road speeds in Berlin, and therefore sometimes say, well, let's not pick that one up because we can't go there. Or let's reroute it so that only later during the day we go there because this direction there's less traffic than that direction. Savings approximately 15% in time and distance. And I think that if you look at logistics as one of your key elements, then it's not just about getting a system that, that integrates with your ERP and that you know, is visually attractive and that can enter all the rules. These are necessities, but it's not sufficient. What is sufficient is that you then apply the best optimization to actually select from all those futures the one that is giving you the best profit. Now, we typically notice that you cannot get much more than 20%. And why? That's when the planners start noticing. If you have a plan that is really more than 20% worse than what it could be, then people start noticing, well, that looks inefficient, but the first five to maybe 20% is typically not visual. Okay, that's logistics. Let's look at another part of your, of your, um, of your profit economy. Let's look at production environments. So production environments typically have something like a number of machines, production resources. In this particular case, we have 30. You have a number of orders, or you have a number of operations in this case, 900 operations in this case, linked to 30 jobs that all need to go through 30 operations. So lengthy steps uh, at 30 different jobs. So it's 900 operations in total, and those need to bake on, on those machines. And in most environments, you know, there aren't operations that have to be on this one machine, but there's typically a number of equivalent machines that you can choose from. Sometimes you set it up in your EAP system that there is a preferred route. And then, you know, if you don't want to do the preferred route, you need to change something. Well, that's really bad, because you've just reduced the number of possibilities from 10 to the power of over 1,200 to still a very large number, but you've also very, very, very likely you know, gotten rid of the optimal solution. And so you want to have the flexibility. Now, if you look at an example puzzle here, 900 operations on 30 machines, um, and if you look at this uh, um, uh, production plan, then one of the things that you can see is that the, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of bottlenecks that we see here. And there's a temporary bottleneck on this machine where we're completely busy. Now, we're not completely busy here, but then there are other bottlenecks. And then here is a starting bottleneck. So if you look at this solution, actually, if you look at this uh, black color, and then it goes over there, and it goes up and down and until finally that order is produced here. Um, if you look at this, it has been checked that in this particular solution, there is no single improvement possible anymore. Every time you move two orders, in a localized fashion, the plan gets longer. Still not the best solution. What's really the best solution is this. This is the best found solution. Why was the other one not, not improvable anymore? Because you needed to start over and get a completely different um, uh, approach to it. The difference is 12% in production time. So what we have is we have a production environment where we have a schedule that looks good, Another schedule that looks good, nobody can predict that this one is not the best or that this one is not the best, but it's 12% difference. And we see that in production environments all the time as well because the rules are so complex that typically there is a padding either in the production or there is extra lead time in your, in your operations or there is extra inventory that you're using to, to, to cushions to be, at least keep the machines going. But in all cases, you see these situations where schedules are not, not optimal. Now, to talk about some, some practical 
situations that we've seen. When I started my career at, at Quintic in, uh, in, in, 90, in the late 90s, I, I got to the company called Eleanorf. And Eleanorf is the largest aluminum rolling company in the world. They do about 1.5 million tons, which is about 3 billion tons of aluminum every year. And when, when I got there, they had, um, they had about 120,000 tons of uh, aluminum in, you know, in, in, in stuff lying around in inventory. And uh, they had about a 40% delivery performance out of the factory. And their customers were not happy. And they had figured out that their hot mill operations, that's furnaces, plus the hot mill, and, and before that the scalping, um, that that part of the company, the most complex part, was actually their bottleneck. And, and, and also that if it got out of the hot mill on time, basically they were mostly on time, but if it was laid out of the hot mill, then you know, it wouldn't come, come out uh, on time out of, the, out of the full operation. So what we did is we wanted to implement an automated hot mill scheduler. And the first thing you need to do, it's not just about putting an algorithm in. Algorithms are really important. But first you need to understand what the puzzle actually is. And in most cases, people don't really know what the puzzle is. So I sat down with the then uh, supply chain manager and I sat down with him. So what's the problem at the hot mail? I said, well, you know, the first thing you need to realize is raw materials called ingots are really not a problem because we are owned by, by Novellus and, and by Hydro and they deliver us the ingots when they place the order. Or, you know, they place the order, and then when we need the ingots, they make sure that they're here. And so it's really about the scheduling. And so I talked with him for an hour, and then I went you know, two doors down to the main planner and sat down. So listen, so, you know, why is hot mill scheduling so difficult? He said, well, you know, the problem is we never have sufficient ingots. And his boss had just told me something else. So there was a different perception already. And then when I went with him through how he made the schedule, and he made a whole schedule for the day, and he got a schedule, and I took a print out of the schedule, and said, what do you now normally do? He says, I get on my bike, I drive right into the factory, that was still allowed at the time, it's no longer safety, etc. I, I go to uh, Mr. Friedrich, which was the name of the guy who runs production, and then I give the schedule to him. So, okay, let me do that today. I'll, I'll take the bike, I took the schedule, went to Mr. Friedrich, and said, here's the schedule um, you know, for the next uh, three shifts. I said, what do you do now? Do you just execute it? He said, no, there's no way that I can execute it. I, I'm starting to replan. So he just made it. He said, yeah, but it's not a good schedule. How do you know? You haven't looked at it. Well, let me look at it. He said, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you can't do that. I said, what can't you do? Well, you can't run a 370 degree ingot and then followed by a 250 degree ingot. This is Celsius. I have no idea whether that's fair or not, but you can't do it because the temperature jumps will wreck the second ingot. So why did he just schedule that? He said, well, what do they know? They're you know, planning. So the first thing you need to do is you need to create a system that connects all these people, that shows whether we have the ingots or not, and it makes the supply chain manager ensure that we finally get them, and that connects the knowledge of the person in the factory with the knowledge of the person uh, who is doing the plan. So fast forward, uh, a year later, we had a system in place that knew everything. So every time they were violating one of those temperature rules or other rules, there would be a little red smiley at the start of the line in the scheduling system. And we've done some tests where you know, we printed out the schedule, we took off the red smileys, and then we showed it to production and said, tell me where the red smileys are. And then for every red smiley they missed, we asked, oh, so is that now allowed? Because the system says it's not allowed, you say it's okay. And the ones that they came up with that the system didn't know, hey, there's a rule missing. And, and that way we made sure that the rules in their heads and the rules in the system were the same. And then we went to the planners and they made the schedule the way they always did it. They said, well, there are 30 red smileys. I'm not going to take that to production because they're going to complain. And the moment they realized that that was the case, they could make schedules with virtually no red smileys. And that's when we switched on the optimizer because now we had a system that was completely in accordance with all the best knowledge in that factory. And then when we started switching on optimizers, uh, we got a very interesting case. Uh, what happened was that we created some KPIs. Not the kind of KPIs you have here in your SAP system, because they tell you how yesterday went. Now, it was the kind of KPIs that said, this is how your, your productivity is going to be tomorrow. And you can still change it because you haven't released the schedule yet. And it was a, a KPI that was about how they used the capacity in the furnaces. And they always said, well, we are like 95% full. And then when we had calculated the KPI, we said, well, 90% full, but sometimes the furnace is standing there waiting for the hot mill and it's just keeping it warm. That's lost capacity. And sometimes you're putting things that need 10 hours and 20 hours together and then the 10 hours are get overcooked. So 
That's loss capacity. So when we calculated it, we got to 69%. So your scale is only 69% efficient. And after, you know, we got people, got their heads around it, so let's put on the optimizer. And we switched it on, and it created a schedule with an 80% efficiency. 80% against uh, the theoretical 100%. Only if all the products are the same and everything goes on time. So we weren't aiming for 100%, we were aiming for the best possible. And the schedulers didn't like that. But the next day we came back in and they had schedulers, they were smiling, and they had an 80% schedule. They said, ah, you were using the optimizer. I said, no, we did it ourselves. We said, well, that's okay. Let's have a little bit of fun. So we started tuning the optimizer, and we got to 84%. And I think that was like the world record, probably. Within a week, the schedulers were at 84% as well. And they refused to use the optimizer. So I went to the supply chain and said, well, you shouldn't really care about that. If they manually, in this particular case, can get to 84%, then that's good. But you need to keep them honest. Every time someone new comes in, you need to you know, get them to that. So a year later, one of the schedulers retired, and someone new came in. And within two weeks, he was at the 84% level. So we talked to him, how do you do it? So there's a really cool optimizer. And the whole idea is that to make this work in practice, you need a platform that really understands your puzzle. Then you need to empower the planners to do whatever they like, but you just need to measure them on how good is it. And if you look at this picture and it says, well, this is 12% improvement or this is 3,100 minutes, then all I care about is what is the outcome? What is the future KPI that we just measured? How good is it? And then in some cases, the puzzle is relatively simple and a planner can get close. And in some cases, like in logistics, you have no chance at all to do it manually. And as a result, you need the optimizer. If you now look at Eleanor, their delivery performance went from 40 to 90%. They got rid of a little over $100 million in capital. And they increased productivity at the same time. They're still a very happy customer. Let me, let me look at another area. Is there anyone here who actually has to manage people? Where your puzzle is to roster or, yeah? And, and where it's not just about trucks or production. And, and there were a few production people, right? That's why I told the story, the production people here. Okay, good, fortunately. Okay, so now managing people is difficult because the problem with people is um, they want to work eight hours or so and live, live, you know, they like to do that continuously. Like, uh, I start at 9, so I want to be off at 5. In many businesses, that's not handy. If you look at air traffic controllers, for instance, yeah, first flights are at 7, and then there's a lot of flights at 7.30 and 8, etc. We need air traffic controllers then. And then we want to give them a break for until like, you know, maybe 4 p.m., 5 p.m., and then when everybody flies home, we want them for another four hours. Now, the unions are against that for some reason. So we need to figure out how to get the right person at the right place at the right time and to manage those peaks and troughs. Okay, so scheduling is difficult if you look at getting enough people there. Now, in this particular case, I have a very simple workforce planning puzzle where we don't even look at that demand curve. We just have a, um, a bus line, and uh, we have two lines, two bus lines, line one and line two. And every day we need someone to cover the morning shift and someone to cover the evening shift. And to do that, so that is uh, six days, and that is uh, two shifts a day for each line, so that's 24 gaps we need to fill in, 24 assignments. Now, we do have here six drivers, and they're available on those six days. So in total, we have 36 possible shifts that they can work. But drivers need to have the day off every now and again. That's the dark gray here. And they also have preferences because we don't need all 30 remaining ones. We only need 24. So there's six more places where we can give someone the day off. And now they get points for all sorts of things. First, everybody can give some preferences. This guy doesn't like to work on Wednesdays. This one doesn't like to work on Friday. This one you know, is really picky. I don't want Fridays and Saturdays. And you know, everybody has so their preference. There's also a general thing that if I can get the day off, just after my weekend, after my general day off, that's great. I can actually go and visit people. So I get more points for that. And then they have skills. So in this case, this guy is actually multi-skilled. But all those others just one particular line. And now the question is, how do I make a roster? Most companies use Excel or something like that to fill this in. And then once they've made the schedule, then someone comes back and says, well, you know, I really don't want to work that day, and then talk to her, and I want to change that, and there's this whole work to go on. Well, here's her roster. It's a great roster. Um, all the lines are driven, which is great. So fulfillment, 
of our, our supply chain is great. We have never violated the no morning shift after a late shift rule, because that you know, is against the working regulations, because there's too little time to sleep. Um, we have given some people the day off on, on their preferences, the three days that they were off on their preferences. And here's someone who has a long weekend, which is kind of cool. But how good is it really? And again, what most planners will do, when you ask them, okay, this is a good roster. Can you make a better roster? You're like, no, this is, this is how good. Well, how many did you try? Well, I worked on it and I made this and now I'm releasing it because I have more to do. Most planners don't just plan six people. That would not be very efficient. Now, here's a better roster. This is a perfect roster in this case. So we have four places where someone has the day off what they requested. And also, we have this guy that actually gets a whole long period off. And that, that's bonus points. That's like a holiday that is unexpected by you know, doing that. If you keep doing that, and of course you keep track, driver B is now really your best friend, and next week we need to make driver A your best friend, etc. But, but this is the perfect schedule. And what we wondered is, because it's difficult to get really good statistics about it, how good are planners anyway? So we did a test. This is the test. It's a slightly bigger version of what we just did. Now it's 12 drivers, it's three lines, and it's 14 days, so we have 84 assignments that we need to make. But we still have the same thing. We have people like the days off, or they like to work a particular shift on a particular day. There's still the no late shift after morning shift. And we put it on our career website, printedcareers.com slash puzzle. And we have a lot of people who want to work at Printic, which is great. Um, but what we're also telling them is we're getting so many resumes that we only want to talk to people who are kind of smart. So what we've done, we've put on our career website, anyone who does this puzzle and gets at least 85% has an automatic invitation for a first meeting with one of the directors uh, within Quinta. So job applicants who were getting there thought, hey, if you want to work here, let's make sure that I'm in that group that has done the puzzle. You don't want to show up for a job in the field and say, hey, did you do the puzzle? Uh, no, I didn't do that. Well, this is a puzzle-solving company. So in a short period of time, we got almost 1,000 attempts on this puzzle. You can only do an hour. You have to solve it in an hour. You can't you know, take all, all, all day for it. And this is the statistics that we got. So 32% of people who tried it got a less than 50% score on the puzzle. They either didn't finish in an hour or they violated constraints or didn't get people involved and you get penalty points for all of them, they were below 50%. 35% wasn't above 80% optimality, which means that you're leaving 20% on the table, which can be in, in, in people getting mad at you because they never get their, their preferred day off. They need to work overtime on days that they should have the day off. Uh, we're violating some rule about the number of days that you need to work consecutively. So, Clearly, either your boss or your, the people you work with are not going to be empty. Now, there was a group that actually got between 80 and 90%. There's still 10% to go, and, and it's 23%. And only this final last part, the last 10%, got to 90% or higher. And three out of 1,000 attempts were perfect. And the people who were at 95%, or more needed on average at least eight attempts. So there were those diehards that tried the puzzle and got a score of 70%, and they tried it again, and, and at their eighth attempt, they were at 95% plus. So you learn, and you get better, slowly. These are some of the smartest people that we know that are all academics, that's typically not your average planner, to a certain level, and three out of a thousand attempts were perfect. That's how much money workforce companies leave on the table, because none of these planners are typically perfect. And most of them don't have eight attempts during the day. This is, well, I made a schedule before coffee, and I took a break, and made another schedule, and you know, by the end of that, I've made eight schedules, and one of them, you know, it's really getting there. It's 12 people. Typically, you need to roster 25 people, or 50 people, or 100 people, many more than, than this. So if you look at what this means in practice, let me tell you two stories. One is, the story about getting the right people employed at an airport, in the Kuala Lumpur airport in Malaysia, 
There's a company called LSD Sky Chefs. At that time, it was called LSD Sky Chefs. Ibrahim was a joint venture. And what they do is they bring um, food, a catering to the planes. They bring uh, back the, you know, the dirty uh, stuff. And you know, you're, 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 you're governed by the flight schedule. You cannot pick up stuff until the plane is there. You need to bring the new food before the plane takes off, and the turnaround times are really brutal, so you need to get it exactly right. And one way to make that happen is by having more trucks and more people to make sure that you can go there. The problem, again, is that the flight schedule is you know, like this throughout the day, so you can't just you know, have people show up all the time or, or stay long, so you need to balance that. When we started generating based on the flight schedule, what the demand is per moment, and then go all the way down to rostering based on all the rules that they had. We took more than 20% of staff out, and the results even got better in, in delivering on time. And uh, when that was said, it was still falling, the labor costs. That's an example of a complex puzzle that people couldn't solve, and now they've built up visibility. Now, interestingly enough, uh, we do this at many more airports. We started in Amsterdam Airport doing the same thing. Um, many years ago, and, and we went from 98% on time to 99.5% on time. The one thing that changes here is flights get delayed. And if the flight gets delayed, now it goes to another gate. And you want to deliver that flight with another flight because it's small, so you can send one truck, and now it's a different gate, so you need to know where to drive. So it's a very dynamic puzzle that you need to keep responding to. Another interesting example was here in the United States, an organization called American Public University. They're one of those virtual universities. They have teachers that get online in their system. You have students that are all over the place, and sometimes they have asynchronous sessions. You ask a question, and you get response back from your teacher from the class that you signed up for. And sometimes you have sessions where you're all you know, logged into a you know, go-to-meeting or whatever it is, where you can all discuss things. They have 1,800 faculty. And all of them have different skills. Some of them can, can, can teach math, math 101, and others can, you know, do, uh, what does 10 to the power of 2,500 mean kind of math? And, um, and then you have people who are doing English, but also physics, and all sorts of combinations of skills that people have acquired over time. And now you have all those students that are likely going to sign up for the courses that they published, and how do we assign faculty to the right courses so that faculty are fully booked as, as much as possible, are not overbooked, and that you have the rare skills when you need them, and that's an enormous puzzle. They now solve that with an optimization from the way we talked about this. And that gives enormous benefits because you get better results. So I think that if you look at your business, everywhere in your business, where it is producing something, where it is distributing something, whether it's with trucks or with trains or overseas, um, whether it's about people and all the labor regulations, there is a gap, and that gap is about the future. It is about finding your way in the virtually infinite number of possible futures and being able to handle that so that you can really optimize it instead of more or less blindly picking one of those solutions. And finding this one solution that you really need to find, the best solution that's there, is worth, in all these examples, 10 to 20% to your bottom line. Now, interestingly enough, that's really not what the ERP is about, and it's also not what MES is about. That is what supply chain planning and optimization is about. And that's the missing piece. Now, so looking at your business, you have this problem where you want to improve your profitability. And whether you're ramping up, it is to make sure that you have you know, funding for doing the ramp, or whether you're managing to efficiency because there is competition out there, you need to be efficient. And that 10 or 20% is worth a whole lot. Because you're not alone. There's other businesses out there, and they just look like you, and they're all doing similar things to make sure that they can manage their business. And in the last 10 years, everybody got the same. Everybody got ERP. Everybody put in some sort of an ERP system. And now everybody is great at looking back. But how do you look into the future? And that's where the differentiators, that's what the missing piece is. And that's where supply chain planning and optimization comes in. Thank you. Any questions? There's a question. Yeah, so 
When we started the company many years ago, what we found is that if you talk to companies, and I, I visited like 30 or 40 companies that had planning puzzles, and this is talking 1996, 1997, just before we started, and what I was amazed about is on the one hand, everybody had a unique puzzle, and at the same time, everybody had the same puzzle. When I talked to them, they all were talking about strategic planning and, you know, getting a handle on your forecast. You need statistical algorithms for that. And you want to do SNLP planning to have an idea what to do. And then there's supply chain planning. Customer threatens with order. Now you need to determine when can we really do it. Now it becomes really specific. And then there's the, the last, you know, few days of scheduling, detailed sequencing on each machine. And, and what we found is you, you need capabilities for scenario planning for the future because you want to run through scenarios. What if we close this factory? What if we buy this competitor? And in detailed scheduling, it's all about detailed setup rules or changeovers or waiting times or, you know, uh, fatigue rules. If you looked at it from an abstract point of view, it's all the same. It's capacity planning. It is sequence planning. It is statistics. It's scenarios. The capabilities that you need, whether you're production company, a logistics company, managing people, the capabilities are the same. But then when you zoom in, the rules are all different. With uh, LSG, LSG Skycep, it's who can drive this truck, who's allowed to go in a Boeing 747, who has the security credentials to be on a flight that goes to the United States, because, you know, this is you know, special rules. With air traffic control, it is who knows the northwestern sector of this airport, and have you done that in the last three months? Otherwise, you need to be recertified, and you need to go with a certified coach. But in both cases, it's just a business rule. If you look at aluminum, it is about a wide to narrow rule on the hot mill. If you go to a, um, you know, um, a paper company, it's about the color change over. It's all sequencing. It's just what is your business rule? So what we did, we made a single planning platform, it knows about scenarios, about optimization in all sorts of ways, about change over rules, about dependencies. And it has a business rule editor that allows you to say, it's about colors, it's about temperature, it's about width, it's about distances, it's about depots, it's about driving time. So that single platform is the same for all our customers. When Walmart is driving trucks around the U.S., it's using the same software that the FDA is using for rostering air traffic controllers, the same as Novellus is using for planning their factory. And on top of that, there is a template that says, oh, you're in logistics. Some of your roles are driving regulations, 11 hour on the road, 14 hours, you know, total, 10 hour night rest and things like that. And, and you know, oh, it's your aluminum. It, it's probably about, you know, temperature. So there's a template that is then interpreted that makes it behave like your system. But it's the same software. You can download it from our website if you're a customer and you have a license key. But it's the same software. And that makes that we have been growing for 40% a year for the last years because that same software can be applied to the most difficult puzzles around the world. And the, the advantage is, is that when we set a record on logistics optimization, that same sequencing software is used to sequence production factories. It's just really good at sequencing in, in very large search spaces. Does it answer the question? Okay, go ahead. What's that? Because you need to ask the right questions to our customers. Most of our customers know they have a problem. Most of our customers don't know what the solution is. So, for instance, when I go to a planner and ask him, how do you schedule a hot mail? Or I go to a logistics planner, how do you build a sequence? I had this planner, and um, his name was uh, Adrian, I believe, in England. And um, when he said he made a route, he designed the route in a logical way. And, and we made a route which was better. He said, oh, you can't do that. That was a drive-by. I said, what do you mean drive-by? Well, you're driving this direction, and here's a customer, and you skipped it. So yeah, it has a time window for today or tomorrow. But you can't do that. So why not? Tomorrow you're driving there again. That's a virtual drive-by. It's the one where you drove by, but you already did it yesterday. One day you're going to drive by that location. Oh, no, no, we never do drive-bys. That is what we call bad knowledge. It is the human inter interpretation of heuristics of how you should do things, just to make it simple. The reason you should do the drive-by, because it was taking a quarter of a truckload, and I was going all the way up here, and I need to take 80% of a truckload, and this one nearby is going to make that I'm leaving one of those out. Good knowledge is, my goal is to optimize the truck utilization. My goal is to minimize miles. My goal is to not run out my customers and underlying real knowledge. 
like I cannot make this temperature change because I will scrap something and not start with high temperatures and end with low temperatures. No, you can also start with low and then with high, just don't make a big jump. So we need smart people to understand the puzzles of our customer and then to translate it in the rules that you need to have. Yeah? Thank you. Next question. Yes, yeah, so, so one of the things is, is, is dealing with uncertainty. Uh, so if you look, for instance, in logistics, if you look at that specific benchmark, yeah, there was a particular solution that they had that was even better, but there was one order out of a thousand that was half a second late. In terms of academic benchmark, that's not allowed. In terms of practice, sure, that's okay. Yeah? Now, the way you handle, for instance, in logistics optimization uncertainty, one of the ways is that you realize that throughout the day, there is a, you know, you may not show up exactly at 5 p.m. if you're calculating that you will be there at 5 p.m. You've already done a whole day. You may have been a little bit fast here. You may have had the traffic jam there. So one of the things that you do is you're taking into account in your cost function that 16, uh, 4.59 p.m. isn't perfect and 5.01 is terrible. What you're doing is, well, 4.30 starts to be a little bit late and the cost function starts ramping up and then towards 5 o'clock it starts becoming more and more expensive. And the fact is that you're not just delivering one minute on time, you're making sure that most of the orders fall in a place where you actually have a little bit of spare so that you can handle some of the dynamics during the day. So there are all sorts of ways that you can take into account that your puzzle is not just to get a theoretical solution but get a practical solution. Now, in other cases, in forecasting, there's all sorts of statistics, and you do forecast errors, and there's way more to, to say about it. But generally, there are ways to analyze what the kind of disruptions are that are likely, and based on those disruptions, you can make your plan more robust, and as a result, get better plans. Does that answer the question? More questions. There were a few more hands. Yep, I can see 11 minutes. I can't read it, but here it says 11 minutes. Okay, good. Um, Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. The question is, when some, sometimes you may want to renegotiate requirements from customers because they're really costly. That's where scenarios come in. And besides that, you can use planning systems to run your business on a daily basis. You can find that certain things may be really costly. For instance, if you're doing workforce planning, and we did that for the Italian railways, before the high-speed railway was, um, was put in place, it's a company called NTV, and they were hiring people and doing negotiations with the unions about some of the labor rules. What they used our tool for is to figure out what if we are allowing seven, eight, and nine hour shifts in a certain mix, or only eight hour shifts. And then you can run scenarios and say, hey, if I do seven, eight, and nine hour shifts, that gives me so much flexibility that my costs go down by 5%. Okay, let's do that, let's, let's do that. And be willing to give them 2% more pay, but we get the flexibility. So if you look at scenario-based planning, you can use these optimizers not only to run your current problem, but also to change your problem. Make time in those, not four hours, but two hours. Your delivery organization for, say, home delivery. And you always give four-hour windows to your customers, and they hate it, because that's half a day they have to stay at home. What if you can give them two-hour windows? How much more difficult does your plan become? Well, you can just simulate it and then see, well, my plan becomes so much more uh, difficult. And, and so we need to charge a little bit more, but then we can give two-hour windows. And so maybe the customer satisfaction would be you know, very good at that. So, yes, you can also do that to think about some of the rules that are uh, limiting your puzzle. Yeah? Any other questions? Yeah, so it is a good point. Um, what we have seen is that there is two parts to getting drivers, planners, production people to adopt the system. The first part is really on us and on people out there claiming to do planning and scheduling, and especially some of the ERP vendors who are typically very limited in that. What typically happens is the first plans that you produce in a project like this are not complete. They're planning a fantasy world. 
It's the moment you go to Mr. Friedrich and say, here's the plan out of a new system. And then he says, well, you're not allowed to do the temperature jump. I said, well, yeah, it's too bad. And he goes like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. And he's going to replan everything. But every single day you get the plan out of your system and it's ignoring the temperature rule. Or there's this particular tunnel you can't go through because you're driving liquid oxygen and that's combustible and therefore you're not allowed to do it. And you're sending them through that tunnel every day again. If your puzzle isn't 100% fit, then it typically is a 0% fit. And the fun thing about transactional systems is you can typically manually overwrite things. In optimization systems, you leave a gap open. It's a small gap. The optimization will ruthlessly exploit it. So you have this one distance that is negative. Every driver goes through that because now we have negative distance. There's something that's not allowed, but it seems allowed. We are going to do it all the time because it makes our life easier. And as long as your implementation group says, yeah, well, you know, it's a compromise to implement software, those people are all perfectly right that they don't adopt the system. And you get the post-its on the back screen, you get the Excel sheets on the side, and five years later you come back, and what's your business benefit? Eh, it's not really there. But if you are willing to listen to those people who actually know what their problem is and you take them away and you go through the effort and say, well, this is the schedule we created. Tell me what's wrong. We knew that. See, red smileys. We knew it. So that's okay. We're now aligned. Then suddenly you can go to the point and say, now let's agree. You execute the schedule. Or you have to tell us which rule you were missing. And in most cases, we make production people, maybe not the individual drivers, production people responsible for that knowledge in the system. They can maintain their own rules. And what I've seen all the time is that suddenly production people become your best friends. Mr. Friedrich, I still remember him. At some stage, I was at another place, and I called him personally and said, listen, there's something that I want to know. Can we do this in a hotmail factory? So, oh, yeah, I'm happy to explain to them how to do that. Why? Because he was so happy with what we did for him. And in optimization, a 90% solution typically gives you a 0% real solution because... The plan isn't right, you need to start replanning it, and you more or less can start from scratch. So it is a burden on us to get all your rules in. But once you have them, 10%, 20%. Yeah? Next question. Still have six minutes, so we're good. Six minutes, yeah. Or five minutes, I can do five minutes. Not wearing my glasses. Any other questions? No more questions. We will be at a booth later today if you have any further questions. Thank you for being here today.